really uh, exploited a lot of work from Yol and, and the, 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 the um, white matter tractography. And, and I'll talk a, bit, a little bit about some of what we're doing toward the end with that uh, to tie it in with this main idea. And my main research goals are to try to understand the consequences of human stroke. And uh, in the Western world, stroke is the leading cause of major disability. So I think there's a, a real need. I think you know, neuroimaging is an incredible technique, and we're asking the public to uh, support this technique. And I do also think it has some real implications, some clinical implications. I think we have an obligation as a field uh, to examine how we can exploit our techniques to understand these issues. And in particular, over the last few years, working with a host of people, really led by Julius Fridrichson, is looking at language deficits that we see following brain injury. And one of the critical things is when someone has a brain injury, uh, their prime question and the prime question of their family and of their doctors is, am I going to get better? And right now, we really can't say a lot to patients. We can say, well, if you don't have a problem right now, you pro and you don't have another brain injury, you probably won't have a problem. But beyond that, we're at a little bit of a loss. Usually people have a more severe problem, still have a more severe outcome. So when we do clinical trials, like the ones I'm going to talk about, uh, we try to balance people based on their severity of their deficits. But we know that that's a pretty variable thing. There's very variable outcomes. And one of the real questions is, can we guide people with better prognosis? And that, as we're now starting to get some better treatment options, can we try to guide people and give them some, some guidance that this individual is going to benefit from one particular type of treatment? This individual will benefit from a different type of treatment. And maybe a third individual, they have to be realistic about the probability that they're going to get better, and a good portion of their treatment should focus on compens compensatory strategies. So here's an example of just five different patients uh, from our database. And the question is, can we really try to use some of the information that we can get from some of the brain imaging to guide this? And I, I want to say one of the reasons that working in South Carolina is a nice place to look at this is we're actually a world leader. In, in fact, at least since the 1920s, we've had pretty much the highest stroke rate on the planet. So we have the perfect storm, the storm of genetics, diet, and climate that help add into this. And so um, right now in the US, stroke is the third leading cause. Uh, we have 600,000 new strokes. And there are some really big advances, and particularly in South Carolina, they become because of our prevalence, stroke doctors are very well tuned. And we have been really on the forefront of treating stroke aggressively early on. And so the rate of death uh, for older people having strokes is going down dramatically in South Carolina. And so that's one piece of good news. The other thing is per year, people are having fewer strokes in South Carolina. And when we think of that has a lot to do with the fact that people are smoking less, but also the doctors are really managing blood pressure and diabetes a lot better. And so we're coping with these, uh, these risk factors. But the good news is actually people are getting older. And even if they, per year, older people have fewer strokes over the lifetime, uh, the stroke rate uh, isn't changing that much. And also, um, as, as we're becoming really aggressive at making sure people don't die with a stroke, it means that a lot of people are living the rest of their life uh, with a permanent brain injury. But the other really staggering thing, and when I moved from the UK to South Carolina, is the age difference. The demographics we work with in stroke are totally different from what you see. A lot of our stroke patients are incredibly young. And you can even see this just looking in the statistics, that stroke in young individuals is increasing dramatically in the US. And we think this relates to obesity. So it's absolutely the reverse of what we're seeing in the older population. And so the, the basic demographics of having younger people getting stroke, fewer people dying from stroke, is that we can clearly see the trends that in the next few years, there's going to be a lot more people living uh, with the consequences of brain injury. And uh, so I think there's a real motivation to try to say, how do we influence the therapy and recovery of these individuals? And so the next video I want to show you, I have two reasons for showing it. And one is that um, I want to show you a patient who's had a stroke. And I think there's some people that think, if you want to get better, you can. It's really just a matter of motivation of getting better. And this individual I'm going to show you had a stroke 22 years before the video was taken. And he was... Uh, 22, he had a stroke yeah, 22 years before, and before that, he was actually a Green Beret in the U.S. military. So this guy served in Vietnam, so this is the equivalent of your special air service. This guy is 
as gung-ho as you get. And every treatment study we do, he volunteers for. And I want to show you how profound his, his impairment is in creating speech. So that will really give you an idea of uh, how bad speech is. But the second thing I want to show you is the idea that maybe we can change this individual's deficit. And we're going to do it with an assistive device. And the interesting thing is this assistive device we're going to use has cost billions of dollars to develop. But the fortunate thing is it's in everyone's hands right now. And so it's become a commodity. And this assistive device has no social stigma attached to it. So there's nothing wrong with going into a Starbucks and having your iPhone with you and um, while, you're, while you're making an order. And so you'll see that in the second part of the video, we're going to have him s still speaking. But now he's going to mimic what he sees on his iPhone. And so you'll see the difference in speech and training. So this video, I think, is a pretty graphic example of how we can change what happens uh, in a person without, uh, with aphasia. How to say what you can about eggs? Egg. Egg. I like you too. Egg. Okay, so now you're going to see, in the corner you'll see what he's seeing on his uh, iPhone. And we start out with the clinician's voice, and then it's going to transfer to him. Scrambled eggs for breakfast. I like them because they are fast and easy. To make eggs, a bit of a pan and both. Some butter over medium heat. I crack the eggs into the pan and cook. I like scrambled eggs best, so I need to be done. Okay, and so. That's really one of the things that I want to talk about today. And first of all, I might want to do with this. So if you think about it, this phone has a GPS, so it knows where you are in the world. It has a clock and it has a very high-end computer. So it knows what your habits are. And so you, the choices that you have available to you can be really context-specific. At 3 o'clock, if you tend to ask for a double whip latte at Starbucks, it's going to know that that's probably what you want to say at that point in time. This has a camera in it. So your, your care providers can help you generate dialogues that you want to look at. And uh, I would say one thing, one of the interesting things about science is rediscovery. And when Julius found this, we started looking back in the, the literature. And there are a lot of speech re rehabilitation techniques that ask the patient to watch the face and mimic it. And there, is, there are some ideas of choral speech that go back to the 70s. And so, What's nice now is we all of a sudden have new technology where we can understand this phenomenon. You couldn't do this in the 80s with a Walkman. We now know absolutely it requires the visual input. It's not just the auditory input uh, that's crucial for it. Uh, and we can really start saying, what's the neural underpinning? But the other thing I wanted to say is some patients show dramatic benefits with this rehabilitation and other people don't. And that's where brain Im imaging can start to become really vital is how can we decide which patients are going to benefit from which type of treatment uh, and change what's happening. So another thing that we've been looking at is this idea of can we use brain stimulation to enhance uh, people's recovery from aphasia. And so this is, I'm going to show you two studies where we work with chronic stroke patients who are more than a year past uh, when they've had their injury. So generally they're usually thought of as being quite stable. They don't change a lot. And we gave them a week of very intensive computerized uh, training to try to help them get better. And then we test them on their ability to name items. And so in this example, I'm going to show you uh, how they did when we were looking at uh, how effective the training was on, on teaching them nouns. And essentially, zero means if, it, if someone scored zero on this, this means that after training, they were just as good as before training. They weren't better or worse. And a negative number means that they were, became better doing this task 
over the course of training. And what you can see is all the bars, the means are all well below zero, the medians. There's definitely an effect that the behavioral training uh, has some benefit for these people. There's a big benefit for the behavioral training. And that's one of the important things to say is that with chronic stroke, there is room for rehabilitation. The behavioral effects themselves uh, do look impressive and say, suggest that uh, there is some room for recovery. But the other thing we did in this study is this is a crossover study where each patient uh, was, for one period of time, they got anodal TDCS, where we uh, stimulated an area of the brain that, based on fMRI scans, we thought was really uh, being involved with their ability to name items. And another uh, training period, they had sham direct current stimulation, where they thought they were getting brain stimulation. The clinician thought they were getting brain stimulation, but they weren't. And so the difference between the dark gray and the light gray bars is showing you that both when we were done with the training and three weeks after the training, uh, when they were given this anodal uh, direct current <coughs> stimulation, they were getting better at the task. And so that's quite exciting. And in another study, this shows, uh, I believe, 10 patients uh, where we're looking at how well their performance, whether they name more words uh, that are novel to them, so words that they, um, that they weren't trained on. And so this is using the Philadelphia naming task where the index is how many words more do they name um, compared to baseline after they've gone through training. And you notice that training in general, they're above zero. The means are showing that they're better. But statistically, there's a reliable effect that when they had the brain stimulation, they got particularly better. So their general, the effect is generalizing in the last, in this case, T2 is a week after therapy ends. So it seems to be a somewhat lasting effect. So what this is suggesting is that we can actually try to change the outcome of our patients and that rehabilitation has some real promise. These two pilot studies are very encouraging, and so the, uh, we now are, are in the two and a half years through an NIH clinical trials to really evaluate this. So we've already tested 37 new patients, but I can't show you the results because it's a completely blinded uh, clinical trial. So um, we hope to have a much better idea of the effect size and the stability of this uh, in the next few years. But I think that's one of the promising things. I would say stroke is an interesting field to look at because we can really start to change the trajectory of these individuals and we can have a real impact on their lives. Does the increase of uh, T2 on sham suggest that there's some sort of uh, recovery going on? Yeah, and I think the truth is if you practice, you know, we're getting people to practice using their language system. And remember, both in sham and in the nodal TDCS, they're always getting very intensive behavioral therapy. So they're going through a week of behavioral therapy. And what you'd like to say is the behavioral therapy works. And, and personally, I still, you know, I think TDCS, we're in very early days. And the question is, do we know the right dose response? How big is this effect? But I think what we clearly find in a lot of different studies is that there is an effect for, uh, there are very strong behavioral effects, even a year after stroke, that if you work with patients, uh, you can find that you can help them out. And so I think that's one of the, the encouraging things. The other nice thing is TDCS is incredibly cheap. So you can buy one of these devices for $200, and that counts the massive markup that we have for medical equipment in the U.S. It's really $5 of electrical components that are required to make a TDCS stimulator. So it's not, it's not anything sophisticated, but and I'm not saying that it revolutionizes these people's lives, but this is one week of, of training and we're seeing statistically reliable benefits from doing this. And is there a possibility of overdosing in TDCS? Well, what we'd like to think is that it's about training these heavy and loops and that good ideas get reinforced and networks that are helping you do a task do things better. It's a good question. When we started these studies, I was very keen on trying to see one of the things we know from functional imaging of aphasic patients is people after left hemisphere, their right hemisphere tends to become more active. And so one of the questions is, is this right hemisphere activity a sign of compensatory helpful activity, or is it hurtful? So one of the interesting things you could do is the TDCS try to downregulate the right hemisphere, as well as upregulate the left hemisphere. And that's a, there's great scientific questions you could ask. The, the clinicians I work with, whenever you say downregulating, because there's one theory that the right hemisphere is helpful and one that it's hurtful, they're going, so you're going to stimulate a hurtful thing? And I said, well, I don't think any negative impacts are going to be really entrained because they aren't going to be helpful. But 
we weren't able to do that study because clinicians are very hesitant. If even theoretically, you're not going to help people. So, uh, but I think there's a lot of uh, a lot of rooms you could go with this. Um, and I think these are just our early days of looking at some of these different rehabilitation techniques. But it's a good point. So the next slide I'm going to show you. This is just us showing you. Uh, the behavioral effects alone, so without any brain stimulation on a group of 26 patients, saying what is the magnitude of, of improvement after a period of, of training on, a, on a, a task. And so we're measuring how many extra words participants are naming. And, you, and they're rank ordered here, so you can see some participants have a really good benefit from this particular rehabilitation, and others have uh, no treatment. And so one of the questions is, can we try to identify which patients will benefit from which type of treatment. And so this idea of prognosis and really trying to uh, give the patient some feedback can be really useful, right? And then the other thing I would say with this, the other thing that prognosis could be really useful for is if we can use a brain image and give you a pretty good idea of what your expected recovery is going to be, we can actually do these treatment studies with far fewer patients because we can balance people on whether they get real treatment or sham or two different treatment arms uh, based on their expected recovery. And there'll be a lot less overall variability. So if you think about planning any study, right now, all of our clinical trials, we balance people based on their initial severity of symptoms. Well, wouldn't it be great if we could use some other biomarkers to try to, dis to, <coughs> to, try to match these patients and equalize them a little bit more? So that's what uh, I want to shift to now is how can we now that I've shown you the basic problem and shown you the potential for rehabilitation, I want to try to show how we can start doing brain imaging to change these things. And so one of the things that we've been doing for years is to try to do what we call lesion symptom mapping, where we try to say, here are different patients who have different locations of injury, and we want to say, across a large group of people, can we identify the, the regions that are generally uh, associated with patients showing aphasia or generally associated with people having another symptom like apraxia of speech and can we uh, analyze this and look at this and I think scientifically this is very interesting it helps identify candidate areas that seem to be required uh, for these different deficits and so I think there's something scientifically really useful for this lesion symptom mapping uh, approach but I want to say a couple things one is for the question I'm trying to present to you today of prognosis and diagnosis it's not answering the right question. This is trying to tell us which areas of the brain are associated with the symptom, but it's not really trying to tell me uh, predictively what symptoms I'm going to see in an individual patient. It's trying to say these are the group patterns that you see in all patients. It's not telling me something about individual patients. And it's looking at each location of the brain independently. And therefore, it's going to necessarily have pretty poor statistical power. I'm going to ex try to explain that with two slides. In this first slide I show you, this is essentially what we do when we do lesion symptom mapping. In every single location of the brain, we look at it independently. We ignore all the rest of the brain. And in this single location of the brain, we say, I know that some people have brain injury here, and some people don't. And if I look at the mean symptom severity, is there a difference between whether they have lesions here or not? And if so if people who have lesions are are typically performing much poorer than people who don't, I can say this it looks like an area that's reliably predictive of the symptom. And so that's the basic idea of how lesion symptom mapping works. It's a way that we try to localize functions on individual voxels, and it's univariate. It doesn't care about any other part of the brain. It's just saying, looking at this part of the brain in isolation, there's a correlation between having damage here and having symptoms, right? That's what the process does. And it's really useful scientifically, but I think asking some of the clinical questions, we're starting to see that it has some clear limitation. And so one of the basic limitations I think that we find with lesion symptom mapping is it inherently has tremendously low statistical power. And so to try to tell us what an individual patient does, it's actually quite poor at that. And let me explain why. Consider one example just of these two blue areas might be two different regions that damage to any part of this network uh, causes a symptom. And here we have two patients that have mutually exclusive uh, lesions, uh, and they each have the same symptom. And what's going to happen is when we do the statistics, each one of these patients is a counterexample for being able to identify that other region. So it's actually hurting your statistics. This patient, adding him in, makes it very difficult to find this region, and vice versa. And here I'm showing you them as two different modules, but you could even think of one large module, and you could start thinking that 
you can have enough of that one large module compromised uh, that you show the deficit, and yet you can have two people that each have different parts of that module. And this is an idea that uh, recently got a lot of publicity with uh, Ma and his colleagues. So this is Masudi saying, this is folks in London, Parash Kevnacha. Their essential point is if you think about how the blood flow works and everything, blood flow goes to parts of the brain, and a lot of times we'll have a stroke uh, in, one re in, a, in a trunk that will cause damage to uh, branches further down in the vasculature. And you can see that across a lot of different patients, there can be some areas that are much more commonly damaged uh, that aren't actually involved with the task than the areas that aren't critically involved with the task. So unless you have a few patients that don't show the symptom uh, earlier to the trunk, you can start mislocalizing a bit where you have your effect. So one of the things I would say is lesion symptom mapping, first of all, it's asking a little bit the wrong question. It's asking about ana whether anatomy is involved versus uh, what's the recovery. The second problem is it does have this uh, low statistical power for um, a lot of different region reasons. Um, and I think there's a third problem with it, and one of the problems I have with it is we don't actually know what the right answer is, right? We don't have a gold standard of which are the right areas that are involved. That's what we're trying to discover. And so it's hard to say what's enough patients. We know it has low power, but how many people should we look at? What is the right answer? We don't know that. So I want to shift to another way that you could look at this question. And it just simply tries to ask a different question. It says, instead of looking at each part of the brain independently, if we look at the whole brain together as a pattern, can we start looking at features that help you express whether someone's going to have a deficit or they don't? And so this is a very early example when our first published paper on this where we tried to predict whether patients would have spatial neglect, so ignoring the left side of their world after right hemisphere damage or not. And so essentially we're looking at the behavior of patients. Some people when they're asked to draw a flower are able to draw all the petals of the flower. Patients with neglect traditionally just find the petals on the right hemisphere. So we have a, a, a large group of patients and what we do is we train a computer to look at the overall pattern of injuries throughout the whole brain. And each one of these locations it sees as a different feature and it tries to say can I find an interaction of these different features that help me classify whether a patient should falls it looks more like a neglect patient or looks more like someone who doesn't show neglect. And so the interesting thing is suddenly we get away from a lot of the degrees of freedom problem. With support vector machines we can look at an awful lot of features and we can start adding them together. And in this case knowing damage in this voxel doesn't tell you there's no way you can categorize whether people have lesions or not. And knowing the amount of injury in, in this region doesn't tell you that answer. But knowing the, those two things together, you can actually clearly uh, discriminate between these two things. So there's a couple nice things with these classification approaches. First of all, the question we're asking is, what are my patient's deficits like? And I know the right answer to that. I know behaviorally how my patients perform. Right? So what I can do is I can train the computer algorithm on most of my patients and then test it on patients it's never seen before. And I can say, how well are you doing? And then I can train it on another set of patients. So usually what we do is we do a leave one out, where we train on all our patients but one, and say, can you guess the performance for our last patient? And then we do it on the next set. And then we can really get a good idea of how accurate is this procedure doing. And that's really our ground truth, is patient diagnosis. That's what we want to know. So we know whether it's working well or not. And by leveraging the whole brain instead of an individual voxel, we hope to get a little bit better power at doing this. So uh, we're certainly not the first people to be doing uh, these kind of classification techniques, but I think in terms of really turning, using your imaging uh, to look at lesions, we're really at early days, and I think it's some pretty exciting times. So I want to show you um, a couple of preliminary studies, and then I'm going to explain to you why these preliminary studies are only the tip of the iceberg of what we can do. These are uh, incredibly uh, impaired studies, so we, we, they've got a lot of disadvantages to them, uh, but they, they're proofs of principles of how these techniques can work in language effects. So this is the first study that we did, and in this one, what we did is we looked just on the CT scans that patients get when they're admitted to hospital. So when someone first comes into hospital in the U.S., if they're unconscious, you can't check if they have a pacemaker, a cochlear implant. And MRI scans tend to be expensive and a bit slow. So what the insurance company wants you to do, is, as soon as someone comes in with a uh, presumed stroke, is you give them a CT perfusion scan and you try to say, is this someone who's going to benefit from a clot-busting drug? And if so, that's definitely worth doing it. So we're looking at this very 
uh, these very crude clinical CT perfusion scans, these aren't research-based scans, uh, they also, I should point out, don't have great coverage, that the clinicians are most interested in just the central middle cerebral artery territory. So we don't see the top of the head uh, typically on most patients. So, uh, and we're also going to compare this against very crude clinical scores, and that's just simply what they, the NIH stroke scale that the clinicians gave when the patient was admitted. So uh, two crude measures, uh, these crude perfusion maps and these uh, crude maps of behavior. And when we look at the NIH stroke scale, we can look at subscales. And some just looking at it, obviously you think, okay, this should be somewhat localized. When I think about language, anyone's going to tell you, well, that should be more common with, with left hemisphere injury, left arm, which should be right hemisphere, right arm, uh, left hemisphere, vice versa. And so we can now say, how well are we able to predict these outcomes? And so the first thing I'm showing you is chance probability of, of diagnosing these people. And naively, you might think, if you were trying to guess if someone had aphasia or not, chance should be 50%, right? You can guess half the time they have aphasia and half the time they don't. We actually use a more stringent criteria for chance. So if a symptom, let's say, is only seen in 10% of your patients, you can be right 90% of the time by what, just as soon as someone walks in the door saying you don't have the symptom, right? And so your chance guessing rate, what we do is what is the actual incidence of this symptom? And so in a sense, chance guessing rate is informed by this basic knowledge of how likely is this. So that's why we try to compare ourselves against chance, uh, where the chance knows something that either the symptom is, is common or not common. And so this is showing you our accuracy, how, how easily can we identify it. And so we're already, you know, for areas of the brain, I would say things drop when we look at leg, and I would argue that that has to do with some of these patients having injury in areas that are out of the field of view for the scans, but we're doing pretty good. So we're doing substantially um, above chance, and so we're doing a pretty good job of just predicting uh, the diagnosis of this patient using these crude scans and these crude clinical measures. And this shows you um, another attempt at doing computer-aided diagnosis, and this time we're doing it with chronic patients. And so again, we're trying to say, can we predict aphasia or apraxia of speech? And we can train up our, our system, and we can look both at whether we have a, a clinician draw the lesion, or one of the things we're exploring is, wouldn't it be great if a computer gets the brain scan and decides where the lesion is? objectively, and then looks at that. And the nice thing about that is then we can work with anyone anywhere in the world. They don't have to spend the time drawing the lesion. Uh, and there's a very principled decision of what is a lesion and what isn't. It's very replicable. So we've also been looking at automatic techniques. And in both cases, having a neurologist draw the lesion or having an automatic uh, method, we're doing um, much better than chance of predicting uh, people's diagnosis for these these uh, different deficits. So again, this is promising that we can do pretty good stuff by doing classification. And I should say this, this work's actually been leveraging your anatomical atlases for giving us an idea of white matter, and then we have some other uh, ideas for gray matter regions, but we've, we've definitely taken advantage. We, um, in this next study, we actually did a comparison of, of different ways we could, we could divide the regions of interest, and we found that your map really helped us do a much better job. So we're this data I'm showing you here is actually uh, benef benefited from your work. But here what we're trying to do is we just use a Western aphasia battery, and we have the classification try to tell us. We know that these patients who were enrolled in the study had aphasia. Can you start to tell us which symptoms they had according to the Western aphasia battery? And once we do this, we can also take a peek inside the machine, and we can say, show us the weighting that leads you to decide if someone has Broca's aphasia uh, or Wernicke's aphasia, we can get some idea of the spatial uh, information that's being used. Of is it starting to weight uh, more anterior regions uh, for, for Broca's aphasia and more posterior for Wernicke's? We can start getting a sense of, of what's happening inside the black box. So these are things that we can do. Now the first thing I want to say is, on first blush, you could say that what I've done here looks like it's artificially good because I'm doing diagnosis. I'm taking a scan and trying to tell you what the patient's like right then. And clinically, that's not really useful. It's not useful to tell a patient, we're going to spend $2,000 scanning you so we can tell you what you do on a paper and pencil test right now, right? So we're doing diagnosis. And really, what we want to do clinically is prognosis. We want to know not what you're going to do today, but what you're going to do a 
year from now. And that actually sounds like a much harder problem. In America, we have a saying that prediction is difficult, particularly of the future, right? So diagnosis is prediction of now, and prognosis is prediction of the future. And so from first principles, you kind of look at this stuff and you th think, well, this computer-aided diagnosis is promising, but what about prognosis? How is that going to compare? The truth is prognosis is a much easier problem for us. And the reason is when we do prognosis, we can use that acute behavior too. We can use the behavior that we collect before the person enters our study. And we can use that and inform our, our classification not only on the brain injury, but the severity of their deficit. So we have two really useful forms of information. And so uh, we're already doing some studies, and, and I'm kind of giddy about the results so far, but I don't want to present them because they, uh, when I tell you we do 100% classification, I know it ultimately, when the numbers go out, it won't be 100%. But uh, I can tell you with our small sample sizes, we can hit dramatically good classification a year after stroke by using a patient's acute uh, behavior and their acute imaging. And this is much better than we can do from acute behavior. So one of the problems we have just looking at acute behavior is a problem we call diaschesis. When someone has damage to one area of the brain, oftentimes really distant areas are disrupted, and so they'll have much worse behavioral problems. Uh, then they'll show a year out. And this, this scan, the scan, the same reason why clinicians like looking at diffusion scans and trying to tease apart that perfusion diffusion mismatch is a way that we can leverage that. And we can say we can use scans that tell us something about the core of the, the injury, but we can also use that behavioral idea. What's this person's baseline performance and predict outcome? So I'm quite excited about these ideas of using classification to predict patients' behaviors and also to have a ground truth of what the right answer is. And there's another way that we can turn this, that I, and this is going to be the last component of my talk, is I, how can we start looking across different modalities? And this idea that we can add different features to our predictors, so not just looking, I told you the first feature we can obviously add in is what is their behavior at, at time of enrollment, but we can also start adding in other features. And so one of the big questions right now is, what are the relevant brain imaging modalities to take? And so we've certainly seen studies that say that resting state data in stroke patients correlates with behavior, and diffusion tensor imaging correlates with behavior, and um, perfusion imaging correlates be with behavior, and standard structural imaging like T1 scans correlate with behavior. So we see all of these things correlating. But then you have to ask yourself, how do you justify to an insurance company which modalities they should do? Just saying that resting state data predicts behavior, well, you first want to ask, does it predict behavior better than what I have from the, the structural scan that we're going to collect anyways? That's the first question. The first hurdle is it, 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 it shouldn't just be predictive, but it should be more predictive of other measures that we're going to collect anyways. They're going to be there for us to have for free, right? And so one of the neat things with classification is we can start adding in uh, multiple <coughs> different um, imaging uh, modalities and start to say, does this actually improve our ability to classify whether a patient has a symptom or not? And so that really ultimately answers this question of which are the, the right um, modalities that help us predict outcome. And so we, we're doing a study right now, we've just got, I think it's patient 60 has been retested, where we bring patients in and they go through a whole imaging battery where they get you know, high resolution T1, T2, uh, perfusion weighted imaging, nice diffusion tensor imaging, resting state, and we can look at all these modalities both independently and together and start to say how do they work together and what are the important uh, crucial aspects of these uh, different modalities uh, to be used together. And I think that's where a lot of the, 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 to really enhance our performance, that's one of the areas we really <coughs> want to start looking at is what happens with uh, these different measures. And so, so certainly one area where people in this room know more than me or are more expert than me, but one of the things we've been looking at is how can we start building up models of what's happening to the connections in these patients? And can we use these different connections to start uh, predicting outcomes? And so this is trying to show you just broken down into Brahman's areas, uh, left hemisphere and right hemisphere, the connection strength. 
So the correlation of, of connectivity between these different areas. And so what we do is for every area, we do probabilistic tractography. And we set, I think it's 25,000 random seeds and see where they go. And we start saying which areas are really strongly connected to other areas. And we can start getting a, a pretty decent map of what the connectivity is like. And these first images I'm going to show you are pretty much uninterpretable. Uh, but at least they give you an idea of this basic principle that we're trying to look at this this network, and we can start to, to give this classification idea of can we look at the, the, the connections between different areas and get a better idea of symptoms. And I know that I'm, this is like taking coals to Newcastle, because I, I'm, I'm sure all of you are aware of this, but there's a classic problem in neuropsychology that they see some symptoms as being disconnection syndromes of due to white matter injury, and some as being due to gray matter injury, and the truth is, if an area of the brain is disconnected, you're going to have the same symptoms. And so we have this huge problem that you could have a symptom either damaged to an area or to its connectivity, and they'll look quite similar. And so with this method, we try to get around that, and we say, what's the overall uh, quality of this network? What's the quality of this connection? So this is some of our earlier work, and another kind of busy graph, but the basic long story short is across a lot of different things like whether people will improve during treatment on Philadelphia naming task or predicting their uh, baseline aphasia quotient using Western aphasia battery, we can start using uh, connectivity measures to give us a pretty good idea of patient's performance and potential for recovery. And so that's one of the things we've really been pressing forward on. And uh, we've been starting to think, and I think I, I was telling Marco as we were having a coffee, I'm always impressed with the figures you guys do. So uh, we were thinking of ways to try to make this easier for clinicians to understand what we're finding and how we're doing things. And so this is one of our, our rudimentary first attempts at trying to show these effects across different patients. And what we do is we create a, a little sundial where the left side showing you the left hemisphere, the right side showing you the right hemisphere. Then we break it down into different regions where you have frontal cortex, temporal cor cortex, parietal cortex. And the network pattern allows the viewer to appreciate uh, where, are the, where are the hubs, so uh, what, are, what are areas that are the main connection areas, and we can start, you can sort of visualize a lot of the, the classic statistics that we do for, for network analysis looking at this. Um, but we can also try to do it where we give a color code to say that here's an area that compared to what we expect in, from our, our baseline controls, this is areas that are really abnormal, shown in bright red. And even though this area has a lot of connections as a whole, it's still pretty impaired to what we were expecting it to be. And so it's a nice way to try to quickly visualize it and try to say, what's the difference? And when we do these graph theory statistics, what are they picking up on? What are the differences that they're looking for? And so trying to make it uh, sort of a, a, a schematic for a clinician to look at, uh, this is the pattern that we're seeing in this patient, and this is what our statistics are picking up on. This is what's driving their inference of why this patient appears a certain way. Sorry, Chris, can you just um, um, pause for a moment on this image and tell us the, what really those lines mean? So this is giving you an idea of which areas have strong connections with which other areas. In your so stroke, this is in your stroke population. This is a single patient, so I'm trying to show a you a single, single patient. patient and then for this individual patient, we're saying, compared to our expectations, areas in red um, are, disconnected. are disconnected. And so, okay. uh, right, so one of the ideas, if you so think about... Okay, so is it, is it, is it, is it still temporal parietal right. lesions? Yeah. Right. And so, and, and so each individual will show a different pattern. But the basic idea of a lot of these graph theory uh, models and how they try to uh, look at rich clubs is if you think about going on airline flights. And here being in London, you always have a a direct flight to all these major hubs, because London's a major hub. But if you were out in a small rural area, you would get on a small commuter jet and fly into London as a main hub and then fly out. And it's much cheaper for the airlines. Instead of flying from Aberdeen to Charlotte, North Carolina, right? That would be pretty inefficient to fly those long distance planes all that way, and you wouldn't get a lot of people. They have this hub and spoke system that gets everyone uh, to the same centers. And so there's a lot of ideas in graph theory that there are certain optimal ways to connect things. And certainly when you look at the brain, you can see these, what they call the rich club networks. 
And that's what you can kind of see is there are certain areas that have certain patterns of connections. I just say this one, this is using some of our primitive stuff where we're using a Brahman mapping. And Brahman didn't have an area 48. There was just a lot of the brain that wasn't marked. That's like insular cortex and a lot of stuff that we're actually really interested in looking at language. So this is probably, I would say, area 48 is, you know, kind of like those old maps that had dragons in the middle of the ocean. These are the, this is the, the same kind of catch-all unknown period. But the point is, even using these pretty crude maps, uh, we were starting to get some nice predictability. And now, we've, thanks to being empowered by, by some of the information we can get from you guys, we've right, been... You know, just an advice, because uh, I mean, I understand that mm. in these positions, <coughs> right. the legions was in the posterior segment of the arcade fascicle, because right. I know that area 39 and 40 should be connected to the area 21, 22, Right. 37. So right. perhaps it would be better to visualize as a dashed line or something. Those connections are missing right. on the basis of the priority right. knowledge of the right. anatomy. Yeah, I think so. Your point is maybe instead of showing what is there, we should show what isn't there. Exactly. Yeah. I think so. yeah. that, that would that would speak That's a nice to idea. me about, about the tracks. So right. I would put, so I knew that this patient had a, an exactly lesion in right. the a serious second of the archaeological because these are the areas that are usually connect and I see no connections in. Right. So you have to know what it isn't there. You right. need so to you know, know just knowing that this is damaged, you don't know what no connections so, and most of this you wouldn't know. So so that would that's be the a, that's a terrific idea. Wait for version two. <laughs> <laughs> so that would be the information that I will provide on this Life. Yeah, no, I think that's a brilliant idea. So we're always tr thinking about how do we present data that people can sort of visualize and get a grasp. And working, this is uh, largely work, uh, working with Leo Bonilla, who's a neurologist at the Medical University of South Carolina. And he always wants ways to have a good idea of what's going on. And I think that's uh, important. And kind of as a very last thing to, to mention, so one of the things we've been thinking about is I think working with stroke patients, we tend to have different visualization problems than people who don't work with stroke patients. And so we've been really trying to think about how to change how visualization works doing this. And so historically, the ways that we would model uh, brains to try to get a view of them is we either think of them as a surface of a mesh of triangles that we put together. And then we could, uh, so this would be a, a standard mesh-based image where I can show you a little bit the three-dimensional shape of this object because I know from this mesh which surfaces are pointing up toward the light and which are pointing down away from the light. So I can give your brain a few hints of the three-dimensional shape. But the problem is, with this type of an approach, a lot of times when we look at lesions, one of the things we want to infer is, can we see anything in the structural scan that looks unusual? We want to know not just where the surface is, but what's it, what, it, what does it look like underneath the surface? So another way that we, we've traditionally shown images is to try to do ray casting or volume rendering, where essentially we're just shooting bullets through the brain and seeing what type of objects do they run into, what, what color do they run into, and so we can color the brain based on what's underneath. And so I think for looking at healthy people, both with that, both techniques work pretty well and work pretty similar. We've always been pulled since we looked at stroke patients toward these volume rendering techniques. But what we can start doing is we can actually start coming up with hybrids that use a little bit of cues from each idea. And so this is a volume rendering, but it, ta it takes a account of a kind of fuzzy surface to work out what direction is pointing toward the light and gives your brain some spatial cues that helps you appreciate the shape better, I think, than the flat imaging. And then this is a hybrid approach of our surface rendering where we're just applying a little bit of color. Uh, each one of the, the corners of our triangle gets a bit of a color depending on what the tissue underneath it looks like. And so this is a way that you can start appreciating a little bit uh, some of these images. And these two softwares are now available. You can download them and try them out. But I just want to show you what they look like for doing some of these imaging. So this is showing you how you can then do uh, surface rendering. And you can cut through the brain. And you can show, let's say, where your fMRI activity is or what's happening. Or we can start showing the fiber tracks uh, underneath a surface rendering of the brain that shows you where the location of the lesion is as well as helping appreciate how deep that lesion is on what's happened to the fiber tracks underneath. So those are cool things you can do. And if you, even if you don't do stroke patients, you can use these same tools and you can start making lots of different images. So I can show you. So what kind of platform are you using? So we do the, this is the uh, DTI Studio TRK format. 
Uh, yeah, so it does. Uh, so let me think about the formats that go into it. It reads nifty files, fly format. Incidentally, the output of it is kind of neat because the output you can view if you have an iPhone. So you can, once you've created your meshes, you can copy it and you can show people. Oh, go back to models, go for a stroke image. You can show people that same image on your iPhone, right? So once you do all the complicated computation on your computer, you can now just transfer the, the simplified mesh to your iPhone and it'll do a pretty good job with it. So we try to implement all the standard uh, formats. You can go to our, our website and download these. They're all open source, so if you don't like how we do it, if you want to add another format, please do. I certainly think for the tractography stuff, you guys create much more sexy images than we do, but these are things that if you want to steal anything we do and put it into other tools, I would, I would be happy with it. I just want to show, so this is showing you how nowadays, I think as brain imagers, we owe a huge debt to people who play video games because our, our modern computers are massively faster. And so by getting the uh, graphics card, we can do this. It doesn't matter what type of computer you buy today. It can now give you really fluid imaging. And so you can literally just go through different types of ways of showing your brain and say, do I kind of like it to look like a glass brain? Do I like it to, do I like to be able to see deep structures? Do I want to clip through the brain in any location to see what the brain looks like? And you can kind of look at that and get a good feeling for what your brain looks like and everything you can do in real time. So you can kind of come up with, with uh, any type of imaging that you want to look at your brain and get a good idea of where these different structures are. So it's, it's something we thought a lot about, and I think this is particularly me working with a bunch of clinicians who want to have an easy way of expressing things, and I've really tried to, to push us toward coming up with tools that will allow you to see uh, these effects much better. But that's a, the long story short. We're just beginning this idea of, of using some of these new modalities and doing things. And uh, you guys are really at the cutting edge of the tractography stuff, and I have no doubt that the stuff we're doing now is pretty primitive compared to what we're going to be doing in a few years. But I think it's already pretty encouraging that we're we're able to do a good job of of identifying patients, and uh, we have a pretty good handle of working with with uh, different neurolinguists like uh, Greg Hickok. We have a pretty good idea that maybe different patients are going to de benefit by different rehabilitation based on their pattern of injury. And so we can actually start trying to really optimize our treatment for individual patients and have uh, medicine that's tailored uh, for that individual. So thanks very much for inviting me.